sometimes one variable isn't enough in terms of being able to provide a complete picture. And so that's going to be the focus here in 7.3 is on multivariate mapping. The first we're going to look at is called bivariate corpleth maps. And the idea here is we combine two attributes on the same map. So there's several different ways in which we can do this, uh, but we'll just think of it in terms of a few different ways that we'll use examples of. First, we're going to use examples where we separate maps to show variables, so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. So these are very simple ideas, and so we might have a map of land cover of the same area, and then over here, uh, right next to it, you might have a, a map that shows population density of the same area. So we have a side-by-side -side comparison. Or you might have a proportional symbol map right next to a choropleth map. That's examples there. Overlay would be where you have one particular visual variable on top of another one. Example over here, we're going to see a choropleth map as kind of the base, and then on top of that, we'll put the proportional symbols. We can make those 2D, 3D, whatever. So that'd be another example where we take essentially two maps. One is a proportional symbol map. The other one's a choropleth map. Merge them together. And essentially, we have two separate maps that combine to kind of form one map. We'll also be able to use colors to show different variables. This is going to get kind of complicated, uh, but if you follow along, we'll really be able to see some cool patterns uh, when it comes to health in Indiana. Very crude example, but nonetheless, a bivariate choropleth map, or not a choropleth map, but a bivariate map uh, here as we have on the top a qualitative uh, classification, and then on the bottom, uh, we have the population density there in Marion County. So we can see examples of these types of bivariate maps uh, all over the place. And we see them in the news here, I guess, technically it's a trivariate, you know, jobs, uh, mathematics, online games, three different variables. Uh, but the idea here is we just have the mapped area has you know, more than one map in which we're just essentially doing side by side comparisons. Moral of the story is what I'm trying to show here. Another example of side-by-side, -side. so we see these throughout Pew Research, news sites, you see this all over in terms of these types of maps uh, being produced. So now we can say, oh, I know that's called a bivariate map. Uh, anyway, uh, so further emphasizing the idea that we have two different variables, or essentially two different maps, here's what I did in uh, ArcGIS, and so I took the uh, Indiana counties, the percent change in population, and so I, what I did was essentially made two different layers. Uh, and so I first off got all the data, and then I said, okay, I want just to display just the ones that are greater than zero. So essentially the positive ones, in which percent change was, was uh, uh, more people moving there. Uh, and then we can illustrate that with size. And so what I did essentially was create two different maps that are essentially on the same mapped area. Uh, one showing positive and one showing negative. So once again, bivariate, I guess, this is the same essentially data set, uh, but I took the counties that grew and the counties that didn't grow uh, as a way to show now two different variables. Another way to showcase is, like I said, where we have two different visual variables working together. Uh, this case, I have medium household in income as our choropleth map, and then with a transparent proportional symbol map showing the total housing units. And so then it provides also, uh, you know, two different things. It says where is there a higher income, well, not really higher income, but where are the homes, uh, uh, the households uh, have the highest incomes? And then what's, what's in terms of the housing stock? The, you know, where do we see the largest numbers uh, of houses? And of course, that's going to be there in our urban areas like Indianapolis and up there around Lake County. And another one, just to show, once again, this is used by uh, you know various agencies, various you know groups. Uh, so this is a what Pew, I believe. Uh, and so here we see a choropleth map in which on top of that the circles, the proportional symbols show a different variable. Now here's where we use colors to show two different vari variables. In this case, we're going to see uh, inactivity. We see over here on the top inactivity and say magenta uh, type of a color ramp and only three classes. Uh, next up is obesity, and obesity, three classes as well. And so essentially we think, think of this as, okay, these are going to be lighter colors, and so we're going to think of these as being lower. Uh, and so areas with low inactivity means they're highly active. Uh, areas with high inactivity means they're very inactive. Uh, and so then we can say, okay, over here, uh, these are less obese or skinny or athletic or whatever you might say. Uh, whereas these counties have higher levels of obesity. And so essentially we have two different variables, inactivity 
and obesity. So then what we can do is then we can then combine those two. And so here we see going low to high, obesity, low to high, inactivity. And so what that says is over here, these are high, high. So high, high means they're obese, very obese, uh, but also very inactive are going to be these darker blues. And so one of the things is you'll notice if we get, you know, too many classes, this can get this, this huge numbers of, uh, of boxes and colors. And so you typically want to keep it simple. Just a few classes, but essentially what we got is using color, uh, we can see the interplay of two different variables. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the map. What we see here is we see uh, central Indiana uh, from the suburban counties of Hamilton, Boone, Hendricks, and Johnson, combined with Bartholomew County, which is where Columbus is, and Bloomington, uh, which is we see there. Uh, you got Tippecanoe up there, and so you can see highly educated areas, suburban areas of Indianapolis. Uh, Brown County serves a lot of uh, of these surrounding areas as well. So you have some, you know, some some particular patterns here. Uh, in terms of the darker areas, definitely going to be more rural Indiana. You're going to see more rural patterns. Uh, these are you know, some agricultural areas. You can see more agricultural, but sparsely populated. Uh, and so it looks like here in north central Indiana and parts of southwestern Indiana, you have higher levels of obesity, but also higher levels of inactivity. But then you have other particular patterns. You might have a situation where you have over here with these pink or these darker red associated with places that are highly inactive, but low on the obesity. So you have some interesting patterns. Now, one thing it's I saw was a suggestion by a cartographer named John Nelson is to, if you have this situation, make it kind of the, the, the legend useful to the viewer. So when you're viewing this, at first you're kind of thinking, okay, high, low, 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 you know, high, high, okay, what am I looking at? And so here by using it and kind of turning it, so we naturally think, Things, as they go up, they get higher. As they go up, they get higher. And so just kind of naturally we think of that. So it helps with thinking, oh, okay, right here is where the high high is. It's a little bit more of a visual trick uh, to move this legend uh, so, so that the, the highs are shown at the, at the top and the lows are shown at the bottom. Here are some good tips for creating bivariate choropleth maps. First off, the all colors must be distinguishable. So if you're going to have these two variables, you should have colors that are distinguished from each other. Uh, some that are maybe opposites on the color wheel or just enough of a contrast you can tell one variable from the other. Further, the arrangement of the colors presented in the legend should correspond to the arrangement in uh, the actual scatter diagram. What I mean by this is this is a scatter diagram in which we imagine if we had all this data here, we would have a particular line, a uh, line of regression, and then scatter plot, and then all those are essentially put into these boxes. Uh, so this thing of a scatter plot, that's what I mean uh, by a scatter plot, going back to way back when in uh, online lecture one. The extreme values should be represented by pure colors. What I mean by that is the high high over here, the, sorry, the high low, and the high high, and the, and the low high. Uh, those are very pure, whereas the other ones have either desaturation or change in tint. These are going to be the fullest hues and saturations. Further, the number of categories should not exceed the number that can be easily comprehended. Essentially, here we have nine boxes. And this is All this is is three classes of two variables. Imagine if we had six classes of two variables, we would have 36 different boxes. And that becomes quite complicated when we're trying to Put down once again distinctive color patterns so we can identify patterns so we get you know we get kind of these muddled colors here in the middle if we had huge numbers of boxes uh, to show a particular data set and i'm going to talk some more about some other types of bivariate and even multivariate maps uh, the first one is the bivariate point symbol uh, so you hear this is kind of an outdated idea uh, because once again we used to make maps via hand and so computers have really made all this a game changer so this isn't really maybe as relevant as it used to be when I learned cartography. This is very important because we had to make precise measurements when doing our cartography, whereas now the computers do that for us. But I'll go ahead and show you what I mean here. Here's a particular data from 1980 to kind of show this whole more outdated idea. This kind of makes it hard to read. I mean, the, the viewer, you know, you've got to, this isn't, you know, something you can give a middle school or they can be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I could totally get it. This is kind of complicated. So what we have is we have two different variables, median asking price and then percent lacking plumbing. So the essentially the spacing uh, of these particular 
uh, what we call crosshatch going along the uh, x-axis here is going to have particular reveal patterns. So here, this particular county here has a higher median asking price. This is a suburb of Milwaukee. So the 1980s, this was going to be probably more of a booming area and percent lacking plumbing. Uh, so you can see here, very wide spacing, suburban area, highly, uh, you know, higher, higher home prices. They're going to probably have plumbing. Uh, so the idea here is we have this spacing going, you know, the vertical uh, up and down, how they show median asking price, but then the horizontal, the widths between them show uh, uh, plumbing. And so up here, see how we have lots of these horizontal lines very closely spaced means the percent lacking plumbing is quite high. Cross-hatching. So once again, before computers could crank out choropleth maps and we could do various symbologies to show, uh, I guess, how, uh, asking price and plumbing, uh, we use this particular method here. Obviously, game changer when we have uh, computers at, at our assistance. Here, another way to kind of show two variables, and this is an outdated way, but once again, how we would learn. So this think about having to actually draw these boxes, having to think about, okay, doing the calculations, how much a particular millimeter or an inch relates to a particular variable, relates to the value of a variable. Uh, so once again, easier said than done. Here, this is, I'm not going to get too much into it, but the utility gas would where we, we see a, essentially a square uh, where it's less or it's the least is where utility gas percentage and the wood percentage is down. So typically you'd have one go up versus the other. So you either use wood or you use utility gas uh, as we see here in the linear regression down here at the bottom. Notice here, going back to previous example, remember I talked about the scattergram. So just essentially that's what all that is going back to here is this is the scattergram in which our data has been put into these boxes and these boxes correspond to different things. So low, low, medium, high, 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 low, low, high, and so forth. Now I'll try to melt your brains even further by looking at trivariate choropleth maps. And so that's where we're going to look at three different variables. And this is where it starts to get complicated when we have too many variables to our map. We're adding too much confusion. Once again, simplification, journalization. It's one of those key characteristics of cartography. Here, when we think about trivariate maps, we should try to get the attributes to add up to 100%. There's some examples of these that you've maybe come across beforehand. Soil texture, the soil texture triangle, which I'll show you here in a minute. Voting data. We've got you know Republican, Democrat, Independent, uh, Green Party. So we have voting data, which has multiple variables. And so based on party vote, there's a famous map that you might have seen beforehand called the Soda Pop Coke map. Uh, so that one uses three different variables. And you can use pattern and texture instead of colors. Um, so that's something else to think about when we're thinking about maybe grayscale. Uh, but nonetheless, typically we want to use colors to show uh, the, the variables in a choropleth map using this particular method. Here's a soil texture triangle which shows three different variables, percent silt, percent sand, and percent clay. And so following these particular values, going across, diagonally, uh, for these over here, silt and sand, you can then identify a particular soil type uh, based on these three different variables. So it's essentially a soil is comprised of these three main ingredients, uh, but of different quantities. And so a soil texture triangle, perhaps you've seen a, a, these before. If you're a geologist or environmental student, you probably have. Here is the famous soda Coke pop map. And so places in which people call it a soda uh, are blue. Places in which people call it a Coke are red. And people in which they say pap uh, are there in green. And so this is essentially point data. These in individuals ask this particular data. And it's essentially been summarized to uh, looks like the county level. And so we have some interesting patterns here. So this is a uh, th trivariate. And so what do people call it? And so down in the south, uh, they call it overwhelmingly Coke. But you look at other areas, St. Louis, they use soda. This kind of St. Louis uh, area. Notice in Indiana, we are what we call kind of this southern Indiana and central Indiana are kind of this red color. And I would argue this is a lot of it is due to migration, uh, but in some respects, Indiana, southern Indiana in particular, is very southern. Uh, so there's much more 
cultural characteristics to Kentucky and Tennessee and Southern Indiana than in Northern Indiana. Also, Central Indiana's got a lot of people who over time have migrated from the South to this particular area. But nonetheless, we are kind of in the middle. We are very much in the middle. We are a very melting pot. We're kind of, it's why our accent is very plain, although my accent's kind of not plain, but we're very, very, the Hoosier accent. It's very, very clean in terms of not having uh, you know, something like a Boston accent uh, or even, you know, uh, Michigan, or Wisconsin, uh, where it's much different. Uh, once you get out west, some interesting patterns kind of varies county by county. Uh, but I don't know. I'll keep on keeping on here. Uh, we often see these throughout the election. So I went way back when, uh, so we, not to really piss anyone off. Um, but here, kind of, we think about three different parties, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Ross Perot. Uh, Ross Perot was an independent candidate who definitely influenced the election with their uh, better performance as an independent than uh, usual. Uh, the independent doesn't really do much. But in this case, you see actually counties in which uh, Ross Perot uh, gained at least some a percentage of the vote. But nonetheless, we have our blue counties, which are shown as Bill Clinton counties, and then it can show value as well. So here's where we use not only colors to show particular uh, parties, but also uh, votes, so we're actually showing value. So the darker uh, would be areas in West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky is where uh, Clinton won handily, his home state of Arkansas, darker blues. Uh, whereas, you know, states like Missouri has always been kind of a swing state up in the air. Um, and so it's got some blues, some reds, and so forth. So here's one way which we can show trivariate data, in this case, political party. What I did was I went crazy and I took our data uh, that we will see here in exercise uh, seven. And I took it and I said, OK, we're going to make a trivariate map. And I used this based off of uh, this particular uh, article. And so all I did was essentially copy and paste this into uh, the symbology uh, for the uh, particular properties. Uh, so it's a little technical. Uh, but what I did was I said, OK, I want to change this data set. So inactivity. Um, so that's the low value. And that's the high value. And so what I said, I want to rescale those uh, using C. And that would be the whole CMY. Remember, cyan, magenta, yellow. And so what that's useful for is those are where we can use percentages. Remember, RGB, that's where we have kind of 0 to 255, whereas the advantage of the CMYK is that we can use and play around with percentages. And so what I can then do is I can then scale this for being low cyan and then high cyan in terms of value. And then what we can then do is then add then to that obesity, another variable, same idea, light magenta high magenta, and then I can add yellow, low, high. And so essentially what we're going to get is we're going to get some, a map that first looks wonky, looks kind of hard to figure out. But if we then start to take a look at it, we can start to see patterns. And so what I've showed here is inactivity is blue, smoking is yellow, and obesity is magenta. So that's what we just showed beforehand using this particular code. First thing we note is places that are darkest are where we're going to have kind of all of these, let's say, bad health factors overlapping. So these are where we're going to have places in which are inactive, obese, and highly uh, high amount of smokers. So our lightest areas, thus, are going to be where we don't see those things, where we see the lowest obesity, the lowest inactivity, uh, the lowest smoking rates. So let's go ahead and let's try to figure out okay, where are those lowest areas. And it's essentially all the I have to do is find the lightest colors. So things that are light in color are where we're going to have, for the most part, healthy behavior. Hamilton County clearly is the healthiest county in Indiana. It has the lowest inactivity, some of the lowest obesity, lowest smoking, and it's also a highly educated population. Also similarly, Boone County. But you could say any of these grays are kind of the idea there's there's pretty healthy there. There's maybe one thing which they might be kind of high, uh, but grays and light colors, those are going to be places, another one, Du Bois County, highly educated, uh, in which you're going to have better health factors. So let's look at the darkest counties. Those are the counties that have the highest um, uh, risk for uh, 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 health uh, problems based on high levels of smoking, inactivity, and obesity. Jennings County, Madison County in particular. Uh, up here, we have these particular counties in north central Indiana. 
um, that, are, that are darker in color. Martin, in particular. Let's take a look at Martin. If we know, look at Martin, notice what in particular it's blue. So if we would visit Martin and we look at the data, we would see compared to the rest of the state, where it's lacking is actually smoking. It doesn't have a lot of smokers, but it's very inactive and very obese. Notice it's dark color, but also it's blue. So it's where we have the overlap. Now let's look at some green areas. Green areas are where obesity is low, but inactivity and smoking are high. And so that's going to be places like Switzerland County. We see that there, um, which is actually a county in which it, I don't know if it still does, but there was a tobacco industry there not too long ago. Uh, so that would make sense why there would be uh, higher rates of smoking maybe in that particular county. Uh, you see uh, Union County. Uh, Monroe County has got a, a little bit of yellow color, a little bit of green, a little bit of yellow. And that's kind of related to college campuses, especially Bloomington. Uh, has a higher amount of smokers uh, than, than maybe the other counties, but they're f fairly active college students and and subsequently, uh, not as obese. Younger people tend to be less obese than older people who typically gain weight as you age. Next up is the multivariate dot map. This is where we use a distinct shape or color of a symbol to display each attribute. And this is something which you might have to see the term called pointillism. And so what you do is you use different colors for different attributes and essentially just put on different dots. This can be quite challenging though. What's, what's gonna happen is if you start putting dots on the map, one particular dot can then essentially override another one. So if you start having all these dots on the map, it can be complicated and complex. Here's one way to show this. This is a map that's no longer available. Uh, this is so frustrating that it is, but I get it. I understand why. So it's essentially a census dot map. Uh, so every single person who took, it, took the census in 2010, uh, they're on the map. There's a dot in there that represents them. And we, then since it's been broken down, this is from the, I believe, University of Virginia, but they've taken it down uh, since the 2020 census. I guess they're waiting on that. Uh, but the, the, what we see is the color coding here. Blue is for white, green. So here we have a multivariate dot map, in this case showing a race. And so we do kind of see some particular patterns. You can kind of see some some different what greens looks like here in the south. Um, looks like a little bit more orange here in Texas. Uh, but it is kind of complicated. This is where maybe one instance where uh, at this particular scale where a choropleth map would be more useful. Because uh, this is kind of, it's kind of with the, the whole idea where, like I said, not all rosy, rosy problems with different colors. You can kind of hide particular patterns. But now if I change the scale and I zoom into a place like Chicago, this whole pointillism and density dot map using uh, different colors to show different uh, racial groups is a lot more fruitful. Uh, here, not only can we see density as far as where people are, are clustered in higher amounts, of course, the density increases as we get closer to uh, the downtown. We can see the, den the density of the dots definitely uh, lessens as we get away from the downtown area, but you can see distinct patterns in terms of neighborhoods, African-Americans, black, in the southern and looks like the near north uh, west side. Then you have the Hispanic population uh, in this particular area, but also up in this particular area. Asian population, very much there in this particular area. I believe that's Chinatown. You also have uh, some here in the University of Chicago area and there in the northern suburbs there up in the Wrigleyville, up there in Evanston. Uh, so more likely there in the northern suburbs. So you can see particular patterns that were hidden when we were looking at a map at a, a much different scale. Even further, we can use point symbols to show different variables. And there's two types of attributes that are commonly used, related and non-related. And related, essentially what that means is essentially it's measured in the same units as part of a whole, so the distribution of a race. Um, so you'll see an example of that. Uh, so the idea there is, you, is you, you have X number of one race, X number of another race, X number of another race. Essentially, it's all the same number of units, number of people. Where then is the other one would be what we call non-related or where it's measured in different units and not part of a whole. So that might be something like for per capita income, a uh, number of outhouses uh, in a county, uh, num a high, sc a high school graduation rate. So here we have different things or different units 
not part of a whole, but we can essentially take those different things and combine them in a point symbol um, that then can reveal some type of pattern. Here's what I did here was I made a map of the downtown area of Indianapolis. Uh, so these are using block groups. And so the block groups are those white lines, the polygons. And what the whole idea was there, I wasn't really concerned of the polygons and the shapes of them. The idea is I have these graphics here that show the breakdown. It's kind of like a pie chart over here where we have white, black, Asian, Hispanic, multi-race, other. And so you can see particular patterns at the block group level. And so you can see downtown looks like the largest grouping would be white. Over here, you see a lot more of the yellow, which is the Hispanic grouping. Uh, up here, looks like more of the darker blue, which is shown as black, a population there in the near north side. You'll see red Asian population right there around the university, uh, IUPUI's campus, large number of Asians who live in a particular area, uh, whereas the typically a little bit more diverse in terms of the patterns. So you get a little bit out here uh, on the east side and the uh, kind of the southeast side of the uh, downtown area, Fountain Square, a little bit more diversity. It looks like the pies are uh, more evenly uh, distributed, uh, whereas here it looks like definitely more pattern. So essentially we did the same thing we did here beforehand, uh, with Chicago using dot density, using dots, to essentially just aggregate up to the block group and then create symbols that show, in this case, the distribution of races in a different way. Nonetheless, this is an example of where we have a related attribute grouping here. And so where they're related. And so here the pattern related race in which it's a sum that adds up to one whole. Now, our book mentions different ways to show these particular multivariate point symbols. We're going to look at one in particular here. This B. Once again, don't really use these as much anymore. These are kind of hard, kind of complex. It's you kind of assume uh, that your audience has you know some, some good knowledge. Uh, the churn off faces. I mean, it, some have said it's kind of uh, it's no longer a, say just politically correct to use that particular um, uh, feature. Uh, but we'll just look at one here. This is from the textbook, Quality of Life in South Carolina, 1992. This would be an example of what we've called beforehand our non-related point symbols. Okay, and so we have these different variables, percent change in population, median family income, and these are numbered. And you can see how they correspond over here to the pattern around this particular octagon in which we have these different uh, uh, sh shapes and sizes. So let's go ahead and let's go to coastal Carolina. So here's um, the county. This is, I believe, where the uh, part of Myrtle Beach, the Myrtle Beach area. So if I look at this particular map, and so I see, okay, at the top, it's really short. Down here, it's really long. So I go ahead and I go and what's four? Looks like that's what its value is longest. So here, it has a relatively high percent with bachelor's degree. What's at the top? So eight, very low crime rate. And so here we have a area in which it has a low crime rate, but also relatively high percent bachelor's degree. Now let's go to the neighboring county and you'll notice it has a different pattern in which it's three, four, five are very short. So it's percent families below poverty level, low. It's percent with bachelor's degree also low, but what does it have a higher rate of is crime rate. Notice it's crime rate, it's higher than the neighboring county. And it also looks like it's had a relatively high recent percent of population growth. Notice it's one percent change in population is also extended. So it's got crime rate, but it's also got a growing population. So these are once again, different ways to show different variables, uh, kind of complicated, but the idea is, this is quite simple. This used to be so hard to do. Now, all you need to do is just have the GIS say, okay, can you take all this data, put a centroid in the county, put a dot in the middle of the county, and then draw a radial pattern out, showing all these different variables, boom, done. Beforehand, you used to have to, once again, measure every single one, make sure it's the scale, make sure it lines up to your data, and make sure it's accurate. 
And so you had to draw the lines. And so it's a lot easier today with computers to do this.